Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Boss, and this is a breakdown of Black Adam, where Dwayne The Rock Johnson aims to give the rest of the DC Universe a rock bottom from the rock of eternity to the rock of finality. Truly putting the rock in hierarchy. Uh, I forced that one. Hey, let's break down this movie scene by scene for the Easter eggs and interesting details that you might have missed. And thanks to Boxu for sponsoring this video, more on their tasty offerings later. We open in 2600 BCE, the voice of Harut explaining how before Babylon and before the pyramids were built, there was Kandak. Now the pyramids of Giza were built from 2589 BC to 2504 BC, so 2600 Kondok just made the cut. Kondok is a fictional country on Earth in the DC universe located near Egypt, introduced in 2006 in Jeff John's 52 series. The architecture of this city of Sharuta looks similar to that 2006 design with the central palace and two kneeling statues touching their fists. Kondok's original flag had three triangles, which in the comics represent the pyramid tombs of the wife and sons of Teth Adam, but here they must have some significance that predates Adam. And the people of Kondok continue to embody this by rallying each other with the triangle shape in her hands, and these three triangles being the same shape of Adriana's Eternium necklace. And we meet King Octon, played by Marwan Kanzari, who also plays his descendant Ishmael in the present day. He already bears the inverted pentagram chest scarring of Sabak. As Harut mentions his darker ambitions, the camera inverts, showing him upside down, hinting at his desire to enter the mirrored Rock of Finality underworld. The crown of Sabak is infused with the powers of the six demons of the ancient world, the counterparts to the wizards of Shazam in the Rock of Eternity. These slaves mine Eternium, the mineral resource of Kondok that was introduced in the comics as the shards of matter cast off by the Rock of Eternity when it was destroyed by Dr. Savant. Here, it's a natural mineral, something closer to vibranium. And I promise I won't spend this whole breakdown comparing this to Black Panther, but you gotta admit, there are some obvious parallels here. Harut's father tells him to let someone else be the hero. We don't see his face, but yeah, this is obviously Dwayne Johnson. But it looks like here his face is mapped onto a stand-in body, one with slightly less musculature, or maybe it's just the rock, like, sucking in from everywhere. Harut's bravery transports him to the Rock of Eternity. Jaiman Hansu returns as the wizard from the 2019 Shazam film. He and the others empower Harut with the stamina of Shu, the sweetness of Heru, the strength of Amon, the wisdom of Zehuti, the power of Aten, and the courage of Mehen. These letters coming together as Mashaz. Shazam. Sorry about that. In the present day, the Smashing Pumpkins Bullet with Butterfly Wings plays as we learn that Kondok is being plundered by Intergang. Now in the DC Comics, Intergang is an international crime syndicate, one of the two major gangs of Metropolis. Intergang follows the religion of crime created by Darkseid to spread evil on Earth, so their tech is alien, but here it is powered on Eternium. There's actually a previous nod to Intergang in the DCEU in episode 4 of Peacemaker on that newspaper below the Gorilla Grot headline. Spilling out from Owen's backpack are real DC comics. That's DC Rebirth Wonder Woman number 1, the variant cover from 2016, Batman Odyssey number one from 2010, and DC Rebirth Cyborg number four from 2016. And like seconds after this, we see there's also an issue from The Flash. Kind of like Freddie Freeman in 2019 Shazam, Amon is a fanboy of the Justice League and collects these in-universe comics and posters mythologizing their heroics, and those just so happen to be the same exact comics and posters from our world. It doesn't totally make sense, but whatever, it's fun. Adrian and the others drive to this range high above the Intergang mines and refineries, paralleling Raiders of the Lost Ark. Remember how Indy knew that the Nazis were digging the wrong spot? They're digging, digging in the wrong place. place. Kareem pops in a tape marked Jenny playing Baby Comeback by player. So I guess Jenny must be an ex of his. Adriana and Ishmael reach the inner tomb and above the floating crown of Sabak is this cave opening that looks like a lightning bolt, but it's kind of a jagged sloppy one. Kind of like how Black Adam's chest sigil is a lightning bolt, but it's like super warm. Like, you know, like a, like like acid wash. Whatever, it looks cool. Inner gang snatches the crown, but Adriana reads Shazam off the runes to awaken Adam. Adam grabs the chief by the neck, frying his body with lightning, and only at the end does he snap his neck finally. This is kind of like what Adam later advises to Amon to make his enemy beg for mercy but deny it until their final breath. As these mercs fire on Adam, he ascends and his lightning bolt glows further and further down his chest to show how he is gaining power here. Adam swiftly kills all of them. At one point he throws one merc into another. With that toss merc severed arm still in his hand, he saves Adriana from falling rubble and then outside he shoves one helicopter into the other and we hear the Rolling Stones painted black as we watch him move time dilated through the soldiers in super speed, setting in place all these little dangers on these trajectories. It's a lot like what Quicksilver does in the time in a bottle sequence in X-Men Days of Future Past. That's not the MCU. You're not allowed to get mad at me for comparing them. Adriana and Kareem roll up the windows of the van, which seems about as useless as the kids at Jurassic Park closing the car door to hide from the T-Rex, which I only bring up because the way this movie depicts Black Adam is very similar to the way kaiju are depicted in films, it's specifically Warner's MonsterVerse from the past decade. Godzilla and Kong and Mothra. Those titans are not necessarily evil, but they do kind of hover between chaotic neutral and chaotic good at times. They are awoken from the ancient world. They lay waste to imperialistic forces. They forge these bonds with 
kids and other lowly humans to become these gentle giant protectors while still giving the humans a chance to rise up as heroes in their own right, I really don't think Black Adam would take it as an insult to be compared to Godzilla or King Kong. And really from a studio perspective, the way they set up Godzilla versus Kong appears to be the same kind of goal The Rock wants, Black Adam versus Superman. And that won't be a battle of good versus evil necessarily, but more of a WWE style matchup where the fight is really the spectacle of it. Carter Hall, AKA Hawkman, watches the footage of this battle and chats with Amanda Waller, and they assemble the team of the Justice Society of America. Starting with Maxine Hunkel, AKA Cyclone. Her screen at the gate lists her alias as Red Tornado, born March 1st, 1997, 5.0 GPA, 1600 SAT score, favorite author, L. Frank Baum, a nod to the tornadoes of the Wonderful Wizard of Oz. She wears striped stockings like the Wicked Witch of the East and rides his bike with a case on the back. You know, da 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 Like Ms. Gulch with a basket on the back of her bike where she kept Toto. I like how she's just really embracing it. She actually later mentions that she was experimented on by a mad scientist referring to Dr. T. O. Morrow from the DC Comics. Next, we meet Adam Smasher, Al Rothstein, nephew to the original Adam Smasher, played by Henry Winkler. As he's in the comics, Adam Smasher is a legacy character. And then Kent Nelson, AKA Dr. Fate, a sorcerer who carries the helmet of fate called Nabu. Now, Nabu was the cosmic lord of order who arrived to Earth billions of years in the past to fight the Lords of Chaos. So Dr. Fate touches this helmet and sees a vision of doom and Hawkman dying impaled. This is the fate that he hopes to evade. But ultimately, if you think about it, this does happen either way. Hawkman just uses Nelson's sorcery to cast a duplicate projection of himself. So it could be argued that Dr. Fate was seeing the true ultimate fate in this moment. Carter tells Maxine that his ship is made entirely out of nth metal, down to the screws. So nth metal is an alien mineral from the planet Thanagar. With gravity-defying properties, it composes his ship parts and his winged armor and all of his weapons, including his mace. They respond to his mental waves. Adam wakes up in Amon's bedroom, covered in DC memorabilia, of course. Adam accidentally burns a hole in the face of the Superman poster with a sticker in the corner reading rock with a lightning bolt in the corner. Clearly the rock is calling out his next target. The room also has various Batman posters and one for Aquaman, the Flash, Wonder Woman, and specifically the speed race between Superman and the Flash. Kareem watches the good, the bad, and the ugly in the next room. That's a Sergio Leone, Clint Eastwood Western on KCM, a parody of TCM, Turner Classic Movies. I'm assuming Conduct Classic Movies. All the Turner TV stations along with the DC films is owned by Warner Media. Watching a movie is about more than just your eyes. It's a full sensory experience. The sights, the sounds, and the snacks. And if you want the best movie snacks on the planet, you'll need Baksu. Baksu is a monthly subscription service that delivers premium Japanese snacks and tea pairing straight from Japan to your door. They source rare snacks from all over the country and partner with family businesses to make their own signature treats. All of these are curated and delivered under a new theme every month. This month's theme is Atsukimi Harvest. Atsukimi is the moon viewing festival. Families gather to express gratitude for a good harvest and well wishes for the next ones. And that's the theme of all the great snacks in this month's box. So I'm gonna try this Kanazawa Earl Grey cake. Mm. Mm. Oh, that's amazing. Oh, I can't believe they, oh, the packaging just keeps it so moist and fresh. Every month there's like so many things in this box that's just like so delicious and tasty. Really the nice thing about Boxu is that when you really fall in love with a Boxu snack, you can order some direct from their site at a discount. Both I and the New Rockstar's office have been receiving these boxes for ages and we love them. I've seen some pics from the office during unboxing and it's just wild how excited everyone gets. Plus every time you get your Boxu in the mail, you can feel good knowing that you're supporting family businesses all the way in Japan. If you wanna try some rare Japanese snacks with us, click the link in the description and use the code ROCKSTARS to get $15 off your order. Now one thing I really liked about the second act of this movie is the way Adam learns from watching TV and he learns what catchphrases are from this kid. It just reminded me a lot of the T-800 in Terminator 2 befriending John Connor. Adam floats up to the statue of Teth Adam and says, forgive me, not because he's forgiving himself, but because as we later learn, the statue does not depict him. The Shazam champion form was really that of his son, Harut. Amon lures Adam into a fight with the mercenaries and he reenacts the Gunslinger standoff from The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. And they even bring in Ennio Morricone's famous music playing over this. He zaps them all in a rapid fire shootout and he takes two mercenaries up to the sky to drop them, but Hawkman catches them, though Adam just fries them anyway. This leads to a rumble through the streets of Shiruta. Hawkman and Adam fight near a KFC Kandaki fried chicken. Oh, finger licking wordplay. Adam Smasher actually later eats a bucket of this stuff before Dr. Fate erases it from his hands. I mean, wh why'd you have to do that? You know, the guy needs to recharge. Come on. The JSA members each try to restrain Adam in various ways, but Adam Smasher finally catches up to them and punches Adam into the ground. Oh, Adam Smasher. I got it. But Adam rises and knocks him out. Meanwhile, Amon skates past a laundromat called Big Arm Laundry named after the 
the big severed arm from that statue that crumbled in the ancient Kondak. This is a severed arm now in the roundabout by the Octone Ruins. Adriana confronts Adam about him killing the wizards who imprisoned him, leaving only the one played by Jaimon Hansu, a backstory that we saw in the 2019 Shazam film when Billy Batson saw an animated form of Dwayne Johnson fighting the wizards in the Rock of Eternity. Now we know exactly what happened there. After saving Amon from Ishmael's inner gang mercenaries, Amon's backpack is left behind on the street with Superman comic pages flipping in the breeze. Adam catches up to the inner gang biker and tells him, you should be more careful with your word choice next time and tell them that the Man of Black sent you. He's mistakenly parodying exactly what Ammon just told him earlier in the apartment complex and still not quite getting the catchphrase stuff. This leads to a kind of shell game with Ammon and one of the hover bikes. They're not sure which one. Another parallel to Raiders of the Lost Ark with Marion and one of the baskets. Not sure which one she was in. But Ammon ends up in Ishmael's custody. Ammon says, the champion is coming for me. Ishmael says, I'm counting on it. And only because this is DC, I just have to shout out the most over-the-top delivery from a DC villain. Batman will come for me. <laughs> Batman, you say? Coming for you? Ho, 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 ho. I'm counting on it! Hawkman continues to argue with Adam over killing people, leading to a fight in Amon's bedroom. Hawkman's wings slice a poster of the Flash. His mace goes into the face of Aquaman. Figurines of Batman and Wonder Woman just get thrown in the air, and Batman lands on one of Amon's skateboards. And then Adam's fist goes through a poster right through the Superman crest. Another dig at the Man of Steel, but when Adam's hand punches through Amon's hiding spot where the crown is kept, that Eternium repels Adam's fist, and on the other side of that folding drawer is a Superman action figure. Aha, so we see the one member of the Justice League in this room able to stop Adam is Superman. They fly into the mine to save Amon. Black Adam Leroy Jenkins is ahead of the others. This is all set to Kanye's power. Boo. But if Ishmael's plan was for Adam to kill him upon getting that crown, I kind of feel bad for all these intergang guys that Ishmael set up for Adam to clobber his way through to get him here. I mean, I feel kind of bad. They're, they're, they are colonizers. They give Ishmael the crown and Ishmael reveals that he is a descendant of King Octun. And he says, death is the only path to life. A reversal of Adriana's translation of the inscription. Ishmael pulls the trigger. Adam blocks the bullet and fries him as he clutches the crown in his chest. And Adam reveals that he wasn't the true champion. His son, Harut, was. Harut's adult champion form is played by Uli Latukefu, the Australian Tongan actor who plays Young Rock on that NBC sitcom. It's truly perfect casting. I love that they got him for this. But Harut transferred his powers to his father, turning him into the Rock. They say Shazam at the same time. It's very sad. We are. Harut. This leaves Harut vulnerable to Octon's archers. So back at the present, Adam depowers and surrenders to be taken to Waller's Task Force X Black Sight in an icy mountain lake. They're greeted by Amelia Harcourt, Jennifer Holland making a cameo after the Suicide Squad and Peacemaker. She says, you know, they say the gods created us, but we're the ones who always wind up burying them. I love this line because it might hint at their arrangement with Kal-El, a god that they recently buried, but nonetheless resurrected and is now helping them bury all these other gods. Adam is placed in suspended animation alongside dozens of other metahumans Reminds me a lot of those human pods in the Matrix. But yeah, this tells us that Task Force X has several god-level metahumans in captivity that are all too powerful to be kept in prisons like Belle Reeve. Based on Superman's timing in that post credit scene, arriving just after Waller says she'd send someone Adam's way, I really think Kal-El may have been the one to help Waller and Harcourt hunt down all these metahumans. Which tells us that Superman isn't the same Boy Scout these days. Or if he is a Boy Scout, he's the kind of Boy Scout who gets all of his other Boy Scout friends arrested. I mean, I was an Eagle Scout. Scouts trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind of obedient, cheerful, thirsty, brave, clean, reverent, and loyal the second one of those. Al gives Amon a red JSA shirt to wear as a cape so that he looks like Captain <laughs> Underpants for the rest of the movie. I mean, whatever, these movies are made for kids, and I'm a man who gets weird thoughts about what part of Adam Smasher's crotch Cyclone ran across earlier. Kent recalls being a kid watching RAF pilots march toward the Western Front, referring to World War II. He says his fate powers have let him live longer than most men do. Pierce Brosnan is 69, but to have memories of World War II, Kent would have to be at least like 84 or 85. I just like that his character is a lot older than he looks, and he's just been good at keeping it tight, but tight with his Mine. Adriana realizes that the inscription on the crown is really death is the only path to life. And we see Ishmael's soul in the Rock of Finality. That is the mirror realm to the Rock of Eternity in the DC Comics. Rain and lava naturally drip upward here. And instead of Shazam, Ishmael mutters Sabak. And he resurrects with the powers of the six demons of the Rock of Finality and becomes Sabak. Dr. Fate prevents the other members of the JSA from helping him fight Sabak alone. This fight is pretty wild. With each Dr. Fate projection Sabak kills, the camera pulls back from the golden helmet of another projection. From helmet to helmet to helmet. Until it glides into the helmet of the real Kent, who simultaneously Astral projects to Adam back at the black site. The amount of mental focus required to multitask like this, it's just hurting my brain. Daddy Fate is a true MVP of this movie. We intercut from Teth Adam fighting Task Force X security to Sabak fighting through the Fate projections, as if each kill is a kind of countdown. Two champions clawing closer and closer to their goal line, and they both get there. Sabak sits on the throne, unleashing the legions of hell to fight the people of Kondak, and Adam reaches the surface to say Shazam. And he joins the fight. Hawkman stabs Sabak through the shoulder and he 
gets stabbed himself, fulfilling Dr. Fate's vision, but it reveals to be a projection trick that he learned from Dr. Fate, and that this helmet, when his eyes light up, is continuing to aid them. Adam finally gets the catchphrase right, tell them the man in black sent you, and he rips Sabaka freaking half from the horns down. And the catchphrase was never more appropriate than right now, because Ishmael is returning to the rock finale to deface the six demons who will want to know what happened. Now he's got an answer for him. Black Adam takes the throne, but says it feels wrong, so he smashes it, and he says Kondok does not need a hero. It has enough heroes, but he will stick around as a protector, kind of like Godzilla. Every Godzilla needs a Kong to challenge him for the throne, right? It's just nature. And speaking of Superman, I go into that fully in my post credit scene breakdown. And really the fascinating story of how they were able to pull off getting Henry Cavill to do this. You can follow me on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter at EA Voss. Follow New Rockstars. Subscribe to New Rockstars for more analysis of everything you love. Thanks for watching. Bye. <laughs>